This is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokozan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. Greetings. The title of this evening's talk is Reception and Production. I'm not feeling really uh, so well, but I'm going to try to do this anyway. Hopefully that my difficulty will recede. Possible. Reception, production, receive. Produce. I'm sure you've noticed, and I've talked about this many times in different ways, but one of them is 90-10. When you're in a conversation, especially if you're having difficulty uh, in a relationship with a, a person, you can uh, change the structure a little bit yourself just by receiving 90% of the time. Listen. Now, it's pretty hard to do that, but if you took that attitude, you might surpri be surprised how much that would clear up a lot of your issues or difficulty. Just listen. Receive. Receive, receive. Perception, production. I had a lot to say about that, and I'll get to it in a few moments. But first, I'd like to remind you that this, this organization, this mandala, this spiritual mandala, which is very tiny and is rare, very rare, does not, cannot continue on its own without your support. So please, uh, if you have a moment, take a moment, go to the website, go to the donate page and help us a little bit if you can, help us a lot if you can. Please acknowledge that necessity to be supported. So the idea with the 90-10 is to change it around from what you may be doing is producing, 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 talking, commenting, and analyzing, suggesting, maybe even bullying, and to Receive, receive, listen, receive what is happening in front of you with your relationship situations, with your mind stream. Pardon me. So those two words, reception and production, very simple. Receive what's rising out here. But don't add anything. Don't put anything out. Receive it as it is. It'll take a while, perhaps quite a while, before you can actually see what is in front of you. You might be so overwhelmed, modified by the karma that is arising in your life, in your mind stream, that you think that what you are receiving is what's there, when really you're actually adding, you're producing things on top of everything. 
someone walks in the room and you immediately start having productions about who they are, what they're there for, how valuable they are, how much better you are than them, or perhaps even how much better they are than you. But producing, producing, always, always meddling with something based on what? Trying to adjust control, trying to make sure you're not threatened, that you're accounted for, that you're ahead of this or that. And not accusing you of anything. You could take a look at it. Perception, production. See if you can keep it. When I say keep it, you can't maintain it, but see if you can notice the way you add on to things. And this will allow you to, over time, to eventually just have just this raw perception of what this is. Sitting practice of meditation, shikantaza, ball gazing will help train your mind to do that because what you're doing there is you are just receiving. Just the instruction is sit down, hold still, and what continues to move, just observe it, receive it, receive that, receive, observe that, receive that, receive that. Lots of words there. And has been said before, as I've said before, if you're really receiving, if you're extremely generous with your attention, you're no longer put upon by or concerned by how much energy and attention you're giving to everything and everybody, listening, smelling, tasting, touching, even thinking, if it's just thinking that is uh, naturally aligned with what is occurring in one's room, one's life, one's mind. You can do that. You might not be able to end the war in Ukraine. You might not be able to end uh, the war in your family, in, in one of your relatives, or possibly even in yourself. You might not be able to control or end things, get things to stop. But you might see more and more and more clearly exactly what it is. Read, envy, jealousy, power, power, power. We've got to get control of this. We have to win. This doesn't mean that you're turning yourself into someone who just caves into everything. Someone whose identity has no backbone. To use that vertebrate example, you might get find that you have a natural backbone. It's called the truth. Not somebody something you clobber people over the head with because you see so clearly and they don't. You begin to see the truth of dependent origination and you're shocked. You're shocked. That it was that simple. And that overwhelmingly disappointing to your ego. Coffee is good for you. It's good for me anyway. So you can use that receiving, reception, or producing, production, and lose, use those structures to observe, to see to what degree you're going in one direction or the other. Just observe that. Don't necessarily c control it. <coughs> Although when I say 90-10, listen 90% of the time, talk 10 in relationship to your partner, to your business associates, to, to your boss, to your employees, to your Sangha members. Good idea. And there's certainly some kind of control happening there. You might find that you just can't do that. But what is important, as you've heard me say many times, it's the intention to do that. It's not a success story. 
It's the failure to do that tells you what. You've been watching it, how much you talk and how much you listen. And you see that maybe not able to really live up to that kind of a percentage. It's very possible for you to have an, an attitude of, of just receiving whatever's showing up, just receive whatever happens, whatever someone's saying, you could listen, whatever's happening in your room, with your community, with your family, you receive, receive that. You could also do the same in your own mind stream, whatever rises in your mind stream, Instead of abandoning what is arising in your mind stream for who caused it. No one caused anything that arose in your, or is arising in your mind stream. If you become angry over anything, it's, you, it's your anger, not your, your ego anger, but this consciousness that is arising that spontaneously completely spontaneously, without any direction coming from you or me, 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 you have a certain skin color. You didn't decide that. No say-so about that. You have no say-so say -so about what's happening in your stomach right now. Maybe a little, but not much. I have no say-so about how I feel right now. And what I'm doing is I'm receiving it. And it's time for me to do this, teach, and I'm going to produce. That's what I'm producing. But that production comes out of what I've been looking at for quite a number of years, which is not built of a group of opinions or thoughts or ideas or conclusions about anything. Other questions? With receiving, is there an attitude of surrender involved? So I don't use the word of surrender so much because the uh, ego, self centered aspect of the mind can usurp that area and get credit for surrendering. Even telling oneself, well, I just gave up, I, I just kept fighting for a long time, but finally I just surrendered. What you're asking about. Is there a, a particular attitude that goes with receiving? I think receiving could show up as surrendering, but it would be after you, you wouldn't surrender, you would just receive, receive, and, re and realize that there, there's a quality of consciousness where there's a giving in. Uh, surrendering sounds too much like disagreeing with warfare. So different words for maybe the same thing, different things for with maybe the same word. So that's very, can be very uh, difficult or complicated. More about it if you have it. Sometimes it seems like, um, especially negativity, when negativity arises for me, I, I feel myself tense up and it's as if I'm preparing to do some kind of battle and it feels like losing. Feels like what? Well, it feels like losing. On one hand, I, I, I want to receive, but there's the other part of me doesn't want to receive. Yeah. So uh, conflicting emotions are we're all dealing with that on some level different ways conflicting emotions they may never go away but but nothing is required to go away
You just need to see what it is fundamentally. <clears throat> um, is creating art or creating things like that? Um, wait, that wait, what? Creating what? Art. Art. Or? Or. <laughs> you mean creating art again? Like <laughs> seal it. Go ahead. Um, is creating in that way, does that um, bolster up the how the ego wants to produce things? How It's possible. Uh, sometimes that kind of thing can show up that someone is riding on the coattails of, of, of the talents they've been born with. And instead of doing any work on themselves, something you say, riding on the coattails, it's the funny part. I said the word art earlier. Oh, art. <laughs> yeah. But you said it quite well. So if I follow your question, you're asking, is it self-centered or egotistical to make art on some level, make uh, pr produce uh, paintings or music or sculpture? Like poetry, talking about that, talking about that. Does that offset like our 90 10 intention? Does it start to raise that 10 up to a bigger number if we keep producing stuff? Probably not. So, again, and maybe if you hear this, if you hear what I'm saying, it's not about succeeding at 90 10. Just, it's just an intention. Just look at your, your, interaction with anyone and produce and receive with using that kind of a uh, overlay or structure around it. And then you can see how much talking you're doing, how much listening you're doing. Qu quite often it would just come out to 50-50. That's still too much. And you can reduce it just by stop, just stop talking. It's not any big uh, um, a project. Further questions about work? Think about it. <clears throat> if everything that we are observing is mind or consciousness, what is actually happening when we receive? Um, a lot of room for questions uh, and around that, so I appreciate that one. So, what is happening when you when you're receiving is you're you are um, respecting the natural order of things, the natural hierarchy of everything. You're no longer going to war with things you think you should be denied or fought with. You're no longer going to, uh, when there's a chaotic situation, you're not no longer going and demanding peace, demanding things go your way or go and uh, fall in line. You're just receiving. So the natural order, if there's any natural order that's happening, that could be said to be um, ideal. And so we have to be careful in this area. When I say careful, I mean, we have to watch it because because there, there, everything is perfect as it is. But that doesn't mean that we don't that we don't. That doesn't mean that we just laissez faire. We just uh, whatever happens, uh, I'm good. It's not the great perfection is not that, or things being already what they need to be. It's much more difficult than just a set of concepts of describing it. Yeah. How do we see the natural hierarchy? Just watch your own mind stream without it, without accepting it, rejecting it, shutting down on it. 
and watch your life without accepting it, rejecting it, or shutting down. Just, it's just uh, uh, Rim, uh, Trung Parampache's word for it was authentic presence. You get, and it gets its authentic, authentic, authenticity and its genuineness for not being contaminated by duality, like this or that, or up or down, or back or forth, right or wrong, moving ahead, falling behind. Is it authentic to this body-mind construction? It's just, it's just authentic, not to something. It's just genuine. Everyone goes in and out of that all the time. It's natural. But to the ego mind, it doesn't provide any stability or ballast or reassurance. So if the that aspect of the consciousness is looking for results and first stab uh, some you stabilize it, some kind of credential to, so it doesn't have to feel threatened. And it takes some time before that shows up where you don't need that, or if you do need that, you, you just don't do anything with it. Come on. Well, uh, in like cutting through, we've been studying the open way. Yeah. Yes. And it seems to suggest that we, that there's something for us to do. Yes. And like Punya used the word surrender earlier. I can't pull my question out. You want to ask a question about surrender? Yes. Go ahead. When we're receiving, what is it that's surrendering? Consciousness. It's the, the consciousness that is not aligned with or sucking up to or sticking to or making demands on some kind of a, of a uh, CEO or some aspect of consciousness that is in charge and needs to have it things his or her way. So we're just, we're not ignoring that. We see that, but we're also not, we're not aligning, ourse aligning ourselves with that. We just watched our crazy mind trying to get stuff and don't don't fight with it don't shut it down don't do anything with it consciousness eventually begins to realize what this is but in order to do that from the point of view of the ego it's going to feel like it's being left behind it's going to feel like we're weak or like we uh, aren't up to the task we can't do this we are not up, we are not up to the task or some commentary that could run by in the mind stream but there's no there's no solid being that, that does this there's no solid being that awakens there's no solid being it looks like there's being but even that is we're to say exactly what that is physicists are trying to find this out you know, religious people or people on a, some kind of a spiritual quest or search are endeavoring to do that with different kinds of traditions. Buddhism is one of them. Question from Shiva. What about returning energies, or is this pishposh? Returning energies. Um, what about? It's not, a, it's not a question. I have to have questions. I don't have conversations. I'm not saying I can't. We could, but if I sit up here and do this. We're going to have a conversation. I'll just listen to you or watch you. But man, ask me a question. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to your inquiry, but bring that, bring that inquiry up so that I can respond to it uh, directly. If you would, please. A question from Tom McCauley in Chicago. 
Does the decision making process change after we see what this is? Yeah, so you don't make any more decisions after that. We're not saying that, that some kind of a this or that doesn't show up. There's no struggle with it. And if they seem to be balanced, like what well, to the ego mind, it gets sustenance from warfare. This or that. I don't know, you know, part of me wants this. How many times have we all done this? A part of me wants to um, move to Chicago and live. And another part of me wants to just stay in the countryside. So I don't know. I don't know. I really, I really like the city life. I like being able to have a lot of things that I can go to, public events and so on. But I really like being alone in my cabin. So maybe not a particular, particularly good image, but it's, it's like that. Realization, if you realize what this is, there's no longer any warfare with anything. And you see exactly, you don't decide between things. There is no between things anymore. This also doesn't mean that if you're uh, making a selection between something uh, on the buffet that you won't decide on pecan pie over apple pie with just a preference for it or that you won't decide to buy this type of a, a vehicle or car, or possibly stop having a car, just use public transportation. That used to be, there used to be a lot of public transportation years and years ago, but all of that's been wiped out by the uh, people who like to control things. Yes. Since you bowing, what yes. can I do with production that feels reflexive. Um, I can give an example. Please. Um, if Rumi does something and and I, I gasp. You gasp? Or, or like what will you do? Levitate? <laughs> it, it might not be much of any. I can't think of a good example, but. Well, let me help you. Can you guys think of a good, good example that something Rumi would do that would cause Sanchu to gasp? <laughs> Wait a minute, Kevin? Yeah, when he stands on the bucket of the big wash sink and then the bucket teeters. <laughs> How about that? So in that situation, I walk in and I, I gasp. Yeah. And then that pulls him Off into bucket. my oh. reaction. Yes. What can I do with, the, with that kind of production? So just that you can ask the question about it, it tells me, tells you that you're that you're you're not a hundred percent on board with what is happening there, or you're you're not actually on receive. You're immediately producing uh, panic, and of course, and maybe not of course, but he sees that he sees that panic. He picks up on that. So less is better. So what am I saying? I'm saying you're already aware of that, but don't move, necessarily move into that to some kind of a attitude of changing things to make things so that doesn't happen. So you, that's part of a, that you could say that that is a, that's a Dharma gate for you. When I say Dharma gate, it doesn't have to be some big fantastic issue that you're going through with the three poisons, but it could be something very simple like that like wanting to protect your son, wanting to take care of him, but also wanting to, to allow him to experience his life, to experience what, what is coming up for him personally. That doesn't mean falling off a bucket necessarily. Is, is that the area you're in? A, 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 kind, a way of parenting where you, where you step in when, when it's necessary with the situation. So that means you're really receiving what the situation is rather than you receiving a little bit of it and immediately paranoia comes up or fear comes up and jumps in the middle of the whole thing. And we, and we completely knock the, the, we make it all about us and not about them, which I think is probably what you're sensing. Just continue and continue to do that. That will, uh, as a meditator, as someone training their mind to see clearly, that will begin to recede with no credential. We won't even know it's gone, but it will recede. 
So I have a question here from Ivan. Yes, Ivan. How is just receiving influenced by dependent origination? How is dependent origination influenced by just receiving? Well, it's, let's talk about this for a few years. Um, dependent origination is the statement about what is happening that is meant to help you see that there is no singularity anywhere. This is the illusion that there's some singularity and the other singular, singularity is, or the other illusion is that this thing moves from here to here, or that there's such a, such a thing as, uh, as time, tick, 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 tick. It's an illusion. It might not be an illusion in the sense that you think, well, I thought it was there, but it wasn't. There was no time. And I, once I saw that, it was just great. I could go forward or backward and nobody even knew it. So I'll try to answer the question by saying this. If you're, if you're just receiving, then you're no longer meddling with the, the dependent origination that is arising in your mind stream or in your life stream. The receiving part keeps the produ production to a minimum. There still may be production there, that is spontaneously coming out of your karma, your lifetime, your predisposition to meddle with everything. Yeah. But you will be, it's a little bit different in that you're actually watching that, you're observing that. You're observing that what's happened, and that might have never really been observed before. It's always been around the corner. Not that it wasn't there. How is dependent origination influenced? So the whole idea of influenced uh, is th that whole area is difficult to talk about it in a relative way because that's that is part of the issue is we so much believe in relative cause and effect. I do this makes that sound and that that's meaningful. We say, when, when this happens, that happens. This happens, that happens. So that creates the illusion that you could somehow intercede and stop that and keep have more of this and less of that and that's the it's, it's, it is an illusion you can't you can't find anywhere to as a traditional saying that's been said a long time ago that i thought was quite good things are so non-dual advaita or not separate that you can't slide a piece of paper between any two things there's no space between anything odd kind of example but it's always interested me. Further questions? Kevin, Bowen, Kevin, when practicing 90-10, yes. I've experienced that the space that's created by that can be disorienting to the person who's now suddenly being listened to for the first time. Yes. How do we work with that? situation. Uh, only one word, kindness. It can be disoriented. And the person who is disoriented by suddenly you're their partner, perhaps, and suddenly, or, or just all of a sudden, you're starting to listen to them. And they're, they're used to interacting on some level where you're used to having some kind of maybe not warfare, but some kind of give and take, give and take. You're not listening to me. Yes, I am. I'm listening. Well, you're not saying anything. Well, I uh, what, what do you want me to say? I mean, we just will pick a fight over anything in order to keep the polarity happening because that gives us what a kind of security as far as the self-centeredness goes. We have a polarity. Sometimes it's called a marriage or a relationship. So I would say if you're working with that 90-10 idea and trying to receive, 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 and, and keeping the production or the talking, you could say, to a minimum, that and if someone is in that milieu, and especially if it's someone that has no doesn't, no mind training at all, they can have a, an extremely high intelligence quotient, but if there's no mind training there, then they just are just as laminated to their thoughts as 
someone with no education at all. So kindness, if they do have trouble, then receive that. And if they, they have quite often, what will happen is to say, well, well, what's going on with you? You, you seem to be, you know, sometimes people will project onto you. You're being arrogant or you, well, you're all smug. You're sitting there and you, you know, we're trying to deal with this and you're not saying anything. So it's like, you don't want to communicate with me anymore because the person will determine what's happening based on their what projection. They don't really see that you're actually going to sit there and uh, stand there uh, and listen. Maybe, maybe even possibly cooperate with them based on the situation as you see it mutually, you see it together. Kevin Bowing, what just came to mind was the Lojong slogan about change your attitude but remain natural. Yeah, good one. So, so, so Kevin mentioned the Atisha Seven Points of Mind Training. There's a Lojong slogan, uh, change your attitude but re remain natural. Another way of translating is you know, change your attitude but relax as it is, which uh, is either way is pointing to something similar. Change your attitude and just be there. It doesn't go in and say drop it, but it's change your attitude. It's something you can actually do. Go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. No, I, I guess it made me see that we're, that ninety ten is flexible, and that you may have to produce more if it seems the person is feels put on the spot, or maybe eighty twenty or something. Very, very much so. It would be as soon as you start to do that, you see that you see that it's situational, and who you're working with there, that's not going to be workable to do that. You, you might have to not do that at all in that case. You might need to talk more. But, w but it's with the understanding of what you've been doing is trying to give that person as much room to express himself as possible. Or, sometimes it feels threatening or difficult to receive if I'm afraid of being manipulated or bullshitted? Um, how can I receive in that case? So you start right where you're at. You start with that, noticing that you're, you're paranoid. So do it, do, it, do it a little bit at a time. Um, you could you practice it, practice it on the wall, practice receiving what happens in your mind stream without commenting, without jumping into conversation about it or internal dialogues about it. But you might have to watch or look, or observe a lot of internal dialogues without trying to stop them, without trying to justify them, without blocking them out or distracting yourself. You might need to start in that area rather, rather than right in the relationship with a person that you think is going to deceive you or lead you astray or take advantage of you, some area like that. You do both. Train your mind and um, do it in post-meditation or your everyday life more. What does it look like to receive when someone actually is trying to manipulate you? Well, it's much different uh, there, if you're if you're doing it out of a practice, if you're if you're beginning to understand that you you have to uh, you have to give in a little bit, you can't constantly just throw up walls, throw up walls every time you feel a little threatened. You could give in, you could give in for ten seconds, twenty seconds, three minutes. You could just listen. And one of the ways you can generate or give a signal to a person that you're listening. There's a several little phrases. I'll give you one of them. How do you mean someone's saying something you feel is negative? This is not going well. I'm starting to get pissed off. But you know, you could change your attitude and relax into that. You could you could look not fight with the aggression, notice the aggression, 
And then through your intelligence, uh, through your kindness, you could say, how do you mean? Could you say more about that? How do you mean? And they might say, well, what do you mean? How do I mean? They might continue to try to start a war with you or push you around or they might, but just do the best you can. Every situation is so different uh, that it might maybe challenging more. Me, but there's another question from Shiva. Right, Shiva. What's the dividing line between controlling and guiding? Well, there again, it's it's situational. It depends on are you guiding a four year old? Are you, or is it your your partner? You, you cannot really let that person drive the car. You have to tell them how to drive a car. Oh, a couple of simple examples. Uh, I might I might have to know which situation you're working with, but I would say if you can, don't meddle with anybody. Don't train anybody without their permission. Don't guide anybody without their permission. So CCC, communicate, cooperate, collaborate. If you're really, really communicating with the person, then you'll both know. You'll feel it because the communication is so strong. You've been receiving. They might even be trying to receive and understand they might come back and say, so what you just said there, what I'm hearing you say is this, this, and this. Is that is that what you're intending? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm intending, and then the person gets permission to say it more boldly. So then you say, oh, okay, well, I was thinking you were seeing this, you were talking about this, and I said, yeah, I know you were. That's why I'm telling you, no, that's not what I'm talking about. It's this. And then your, your partner, your mate, then you look at each other and you might have some more clarity and you might re be ready to go to the next C, which is not cop out. Let's cooperate. Look at, look at, uh, um, what, what's the other C word? Compromise. I don't particularly promote that one, but the, it might show up that way. You want this, they want that. Well, let's, let's find a way to work with that so that we can not be at war about it. So as far as guiding or controlling, it's, there's so many situations there that it would depend on what, who it is, how old they are, uh, if you have permission. Of course, you don't really need permission from a four-year-old to guide them or control them. But you could still look at the situation and see how much, how much protection do they actually need. Maybe they need to get in a little bit of trouble here. So that they can learn from their experience rather than having some kind of a, someone in charge of them constantly. Oh, Dubai, how important is it to see how we fail at receiving, to be able to see our ego? It's important to see that. I guess my question is more, how important is it to fail? You need to see that. So, yeah, there's going to be failure. The spiritual path is not a path of accomplishments, even though it's talked about that, talked uh, about in that way, like the, the Bodhisattva path of being 10 bumis, traditionally usually 10, or stages on the path of, of uh, being a nobody who helps others. And if you, if you read those, I know they tie them into the Paramitas and they, a lot of Jabberwocky going on there. Not to be disrespectful, but it tends to make us or cause us to look for, you know, am I, am I on the third boomy or fourth boomy? So if you ever ask anybody what boomy they're on and they tell you, I'd like to hear about that. I'd like to meet that uh, boomika person. So, I sometimes tell the story, and I'll tell it now. Trunk Bar and in the first seminary in 1973, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where the, the Grand Tetons are. I think those are mountains, aren't they? He was asked, so he was talking about the boomies. He was so, so Rinpoche, which boomie are you on? And he said, and I paraphrase, but it's pretty close to what he said. 
uh, Teton Boomy. He probably said Teton Boomy because he had a squeaky voice. So what is he doing? Instead of saying he's he's making fun of it, and I'm not saying he did anything wrong. I'm not going to criticize my teacher in that way, but it seemed like it would have been a good opportunity to address that uh, in in a way that would that would be more encompassing rather than just make a slight joke out of it. I'm sure it was extremely funny. Uh, I guess I'm wanting to know what can we learn about our ego or see when we're seeing ourselves uh, produce or not receive, shut down on receiving. You can, over time, you will eventually see there is an aspect of consciousness that that want that grasps and wants control and wants to say so and does not want to be exposed and will do whatever it can including just invent a bunch of propaganda about it to display to one's partner or or to one's community or to one's teacher more yes i'm, I'm not getting my question out. I'll have to think about it. But. So let's, let's do it together. What, what is it you want to know? That could you can, you can respond to that. I want to, I want to, I want to know. I want to know. I want to know how to see my ego, uh, how to loosen the grip. Loosening the grip, right? It's more materialistic approach and that that can show up as you can spend a lot of time loosening the grip so what we do is what I say quite often is just see the what look at the grip it's not that you the, the grip can't uh, come apart but it will it has to do it by taking away its nutrition because you can't just undo it because it's not that kind of it's not this kind of a grip but if you look at it you'll see that it looks like this uh, initially but then as you watch it you, uh, and you don't add to it. If you, as you watch it, you don't subtract from it or judge it. That's hard not to judge because it's it's much easier to feel like you're getting somewhere by being against ego. And ego will take any energy it can get, including warfare, to keep going. So it's a very difficult. It's very uh, Not, there's not a good word for that there, but it's just a uh, very uh, not a good word, but it's just relaxing and uh, relax into that. Allow that to be what allow that ego to do whatever it wants to do. Because you're now you're really looking at that grip, at that death grip on it, and that that eventually will unwind on its own just by not being supplied with. Pushing, pulling, or shutting down the passion, aggression, and ignorance that is run by what? Hope and fear. Hope for things are you're going to get better. It won't be as bad tomorrow. That difficulty will go away. And, and all kinds of fear. Fear that you're going to be found out. People will see what a fool you are. Go ahead. What about you? Is that feeling to receive? Failing to receive is to, is to go and shut things down or cover it up. Ignore it, fight with it, or justify it, or explain it, and see, uh, or blame someone else for it. Blame some. I was shutting down, or I was, uh, I was opening up pretty good until she said, they said, he said, they did that. You've done that with me. And am I saying don't do that? Somewhat, but more. Look at the way you shut down. You don't have to get rid of that. You don't ever have to get rid of anything you may be able to it may help you to teach others to just see the your own neurosis and realize that there's no one who's neurotic there's no personhood there the neurosis may need to run its trip for the next 30 years 50 years it may never end it may never get better you don't need to get better
What's it again? Is it a misunderstanding to feel like I can't look at what's coming up for me and receive what somebody else is saying at the same time? No, well, that's an observation. That's and there's a conclusion there. So, what happens when that when that shows up? Do you turn that into a, a production towards them? Sometimes when I feel like I really need to look at, I can see that I'm going to end up producing one way or another. Yeah. So, and, and of course, uh, of course, it is situational. Sometimes it's good to just break the connection. There's nothing wrong with just saying, I can't, I can't discuss this anymore. Walk away. It might be better than laboriously trying to get to some kind of consensus between the two of you, if it's a relationship dynamic. Is it more important to receive what shows up in our mind stream or our own triggers or than to receive what other people are saying. Just receive. It's nothing you're not to fix anything. Kevin Bowie, I had a question about Bort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bort. <laughs> you mean fine Bort? Bort. <laughs> <laughs> Or crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the process of creating, it feels like there can be inspiration, but then there can be a constricting that happens before some producing takes place. Yes. What's going on there? No. Could be any number of things. Fear, fear of being judged, fear of putting a whole lot of energy into something that you're all, you know, you're all uh, excited about and then have it be, a, you know, in your own eyes, have it be a dud or just have it, but all this energy. You know, you're, if you're a painter, you've just worked on a 15 by 20 mural and then, you know, the three, four weeks have gone by, you've been working on it and then you step back one day and look at it and you and you're it's like this is terrible <laughs> i've been there so i know about it and you have all this work you have all this and sometimes if you're very practical you know you have a lot of uh, a lot of earth signs in your chart you might bemoan that all the money you spent on paint you know and you've got a piece of junk but then somebody else will come along and say Oh my God, that is fantastic. How do you do that? And then you go, how did I do what? <laughs> how did I do what? Tell, tell, tell me, tell me. And then they say, just joking. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably your, probably your teacher's going to tell you that. But not necessarily. Sometimes, uh, I had an art teacher at the Art Institute of Chicago. I can still remember his name, Mr. Underdunk. Wonderful uh, fellow, and I thought he was a kind of a aged fellow, and he probably wasn't any more than sixty-five or seventy, which is pretty young. <laughs> uh, but he's just, he had a really great way of, of, of supporting you in what you were doing because I was really struggling with trying to open my eye mind, which I found that. He was one of the few people I met there that actually was uh, an, uh, was an instructor, he was a very good one. And um, he would just encourage me, no matter how, what kind of crap I would bring to him, he would find some kind of w positive way so that it would keep me coming back and working with it and producing it. Uh, very, uh, it was, uh, I, I remember more about the interactions with him than with any other teacher. And he was an, he was just a, I had a, a full day class and I heard about him and took a night class so I could get more instruction uh, when I was going there back in the early 60s. So, I just, I'm laughing because I just remember how he would, excited he would get about a crappy piece of work that I, I knew it was not good, but he would find some way to work with that that would be, that would be encouraging 
he's the one that that uh, had me. Uh, I had an idea. I really liked the, the, like the paintings of Franz uh, Klein, the New York School painter, died in his 50s, sorry to say. Uh, incredible painter. And uh, uh, if you look up Franz Klein, you'll see uh, landscape kind of, but they aren't they're abstractions. They're, they're, you can't even tell what they are, but they're named after overpasses and highways and things like that because they're black, big, huge black. The paintings are like, eight by 15 or something and they were uh, feet and there would be just crisscross black lines maybe a little bit of red in the corner something most of them they're just incredible compositions and i was just slowly becoming tuned into what that 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 simple composition how that worked and um and i, I mentioned that to him and i said i was trying to think how i could uh, how i could really do uh, work with really large compositions like that and i and i said I said, I was thinking about getting, maybe getting some butcher paper, and he went right there with me. He says, yes, he says, we could put it up down at this, and you could roll it right across that wall, and you could get, uh, I think he, we did it together. I, I don't know who did what, but I ended up getting cheap black acrylic paint, and uh, you know, it wasn't that cheap, uh, but it was, you know, I had to have some black paint, so, and put it in a, in a uh, you know, peanut butter jar or something like that. And then in just, just did really large compositions and then I would run them right off, right into the trash. So there's a trash can at the other end. So it was just about doing those. Anytime I'd come to class, that was my project. Everyone else was doing something else. So he's extremely helpful in that way. I did not produce a masterpiece. I've never produced a masterpiece, but I, but I did a lot of work trying to understand uh, visual uh, composition, I mind trying to understand how consciousness works visually. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Roll it down, do the best you can, look at it, and then put it in the trash. Roll out some more white area. It's like ball gazing. Very similar situation. No result. Just practice, practice, practice. Where we, we have, 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 yes, go ahead, please. Um, when you are sitting down to the creative act, whether it's writing or, or performing or, uh, or drawing, and you're aware that you are in production yeah. mode, what is the receiving in that moment? Receive the feeling of your butt on the chair or your feet on the ground and the noise down the hallway and the color of the wall around what you're looking at or the tabletop, or the coffee cup. Receive everything. Include, include, include. Don't miss anything. But don't necessarily go around and notice the things you're probably missing. Excuse me. Just include. Include the paper if you're drawing. Include the writing. Include the sound of the words. Uh, include the, the stickiness of trying to come up with a, uh, with a compound sentence that works in, a, in an aesthetic way, in a way that's... Uh, that it has, has a quality to it that moves beyond uh, the, the various words you gather together to express something. And then spend a lot of time reading uh, Pablo Neruda. <laughs> In Spanish, of course, if you can. Yeah, he was an amazing, as you know, I mean, it's your native language. He was amazing, amazing that he could move words and, and not, not being a Spanish speaker, but Still, even the translations to give you an idea about how he was able to move structures of words and grammar in such a way that what that he would push them together in such a way that they would start to Reality itself would start to drip right out of it. Pardon my weeping, it's choiceless. Are there further questions? Tishin bowing. <clears throat> You were talking before about the natural hierarchy. Is 
is that uh, within within the natural hierarchy the role of sentient being <coughs> just to receive I'm, I'm not following that could you could you either paraphrase it or, or just repeat it and i'll try to pick up what it is you're wanting to know about Jishin. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering whether natural hierarchy is is kind of designating a certain role to to sentient beings, and whether that role is just to receive. Um, well, there's going to be reception and production, like any any communication, cooperation, collaboration. So there's going to be energy being exchanged going different directions but there needs to be a lot of receiving otherwise the communication if it's not clear then it it gets uh, it just uh doesn't turn out well it's lack of communication we don't we don't we're, we bump heads around the whole thing we don't cooperate so it's possible that we could it's possible we could do that some people do that very very well and don't even have any mind training they're just born to function in that way it seems so i don't know if i can respond to your question in a in a way that's going to be satisfactory to you but i uh, i would say receive <clears throat> receive like uh oolong's question about you know just uh, i'm just receive what's in front of you. you're producing something but receive what's being produced receive the paper receive the, the feeling of your clothes receive everything don't don't exclude anything and don't necessarily uh, uh stop receiving the expectation that you're going to have to produce some beautiful piece of artwork or beautiful music or poetry or any other thing that would be creative even in more uh um, mundane forms include that too include everything thank you Okay, I guess we can close then. Thank you, thank you.